All right, uh, we are recording. I do record all of these. Uh, sometimes we go through stuff pretty quickly. And so I record it for you guys. If you ever wanna go back and, and watch something, relearn something, rehear a joke I told. Sometimes I tell jokes, <laughs> I tell jokes today, um, but I will. I will maybe starting next week. This week is gonna be kind of crazy because it's a block course. So in week one, we cover what's regularly covered in weeks one and two. But in addition to that, this week one is only like four days long. So you guys are about to get two weeks of stuff in four days and I really feel for you. Um, so I'm gonna to try to be as productive as possible in this class to help you guys as much as possible um, this week. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, my spiritual thought today comes from the Book of Mormon in First Nephi chapter two. Uh, I love Nephi for a lot of different reasons, uh, but especially since I became a parent, I've thought a lot about him and his brothers and his brothers who kind of fell away and were super rebellious all along. I'm like, man, what was the difference? And um, I, I found a couple answers to that question. What was the difference between Nephi and his brothers? Now, obviously we all have our, our, our agency and, um, but there were a couple of things that he did that we can see that he did that I feel like were turning points in his life. Uh, the first one I want to mention is in first Nephi chapter two, verse 16. This is shortly after the Lord told Lehi in a dream to leave Jerusalem and with their family and not go back. And uh, his brothers were murmuring and they're like, dude, we don't want to leave this place. This is our home. And here's what Nephi said in verse 16. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, being exceedingly young, nevertheless being large in stature, and also having great desires to know of the mysteries of God. Wherefore, I did cry unto the Lord. And behold, he did visit me and did soften my heart that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father. Wherefore, I did not rebel against him like unto my brothers. I think this is huge. Um, having great desires to know of the mysteries of God. And apparently he had faith because then he cried unto the Lord um, and received an answer to his prayer. The, the Holy Ghost filled his heart uh, in such a way that, that he believed all the words that his father had spoken. Uh, then in 1 Nephi chapter 10, verse 17, we see similar. This is after Lehi uh, had shared... His, his vision of the tree of life with his kids it said, and it came to pass that after I Nephi having heard all the words of my father concerning the things which he saw in a vision and also the things which he spake by the power of the Holy ghost, which power he received by faith on the son of God. And the son of God was the Messiah who should come. I Nephi was desirous also that I might see and hear and know of these things by the power of the Holy ghost, which is the gift of God unto all those who diligently seek him as well in times of old, as in the time that he should manifest himself under the children of men. And so you can definitely feel a difference in his words here, you know, just a couple of chapters later. But again, you know, he had a doubt about something. He wasn't sure about something. Instead of deciding to murmur about it to, to his brothers or whatever, um, he decided to pray. And, um, and I love seeing that. And it makes me think about my own life and, and moments where I have doubts and I choose to focus on the Lord and moments where I choose to not focus on the Lord. Those two things take me into very different directions and I can feel that the next day. And sometimes for the next phase of my life, you look at Nephi and his brothers and their paths just, it seems that they just kept on getting further and further and further apart because of small, seemingly small decisions like this. And so um, I, I share this with you guys today to invite all of us as, as we start a new semester and we all have lots of stuff going on in our lives. You guys are taking a bunch of classes. You guys have two weeks of Python stuff to learn in four days. You know, we're going to have stressful times over the next few months. And, and when they hit, uh, remember to rely on the Lord and put him first. Um, when you wake up tomorrow, you'll be in a much better place than you would have been otherwise. All right. Gavin, you want to share, say a prayer for us? Thank you. Heavenly Father, we pray unto thee at this time as we are beginning a new semester here at BYU-Idaho. We are grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives and for the direction that you give us in our daily lives. We're grateful, Heavenly Father, to be able to go to a school where we can have similar religious beliefs between our fellow students. We are also grateful for the tithing dollars that are spent on us to be able to help us in our education and keeping tuition costs low. We are also grateful, Heavenly Father, and ask thee to bless those that pay the tithe dollars to run this school. 
We ask Heavenly Father that as we learn and grow and stretch this upcoming semester that we may be able to take these things that we learn into our careers to be able to become better and more productive people and to be able to continue to build the kingdom of God on this earth. We pray, Heavenly Father, in gratitude for all that that has done. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gavin. All right, you guys, let's dive right in. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Can I ask a quick question before we get started? Please, yeah. So um, I am a big Mac OS user, which okay. may um, rub some people the wrong way. I don't know. But uh, I was wondering, I do run a virtual machine all the time for my degree. Uh, would it be better for this class to run Python in Windows or Mac OS? Either one. OK. Either one. Yeah, good question. All right, you guys. So a couple of things. Before, before I dive into the course and the course structure and everything, uh, you should have all received a welcome email from me this week, either yesterday or two days ago. Uh, and in it was a link to a spreadsheet used that looks like this. Okay, this is one of my favorite things to do every semester. I love getting to know you guys on a more personal level that class time really doesn't allow that much. Um, and so this is an opportunity for you guys to have a student interview with me. I'm not going to like ask you a bunch of interview questions. I'll probably ask you about you. Uh, and you guys can ask me just as many questions as I, ask, as I ask you. It's just a chance for us to get to know each other. If you guys want help with advising or planning classes or career prospects later on down the road, or just talking about favorite colors, like whatever, you know, I, I just want to get to know you guys. Um, so yeah, this is totally optional. But if you follow that link and, and you want to sign up, just put your name in one of these slots. Uh, I'll be on Zoom during these times at this link. Um, and I'll just let people in the room as their turns come around. So uh, just a shout out to that. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm excited, you guys. This is going to be awesome. Okay, CSE 110, programming with or programming building blocks. So this is in Python. If you guys didn't know, we're going to be learning programming in Python. You can learn how to program in a lot of different languages. Uh, I like to think of it as my kids. I, I spoke to my kids in Portuguese for the first few years of their, of their lives. And it was interesting how, you know, at just a young age, like a three-year-old kid could come up to me and explain the exact same thing to me in two different languages. Well, programming languages are kind of the same, okay? If you wanted to learn how to write a program, you could do it in JavaScript or C or C++ or Java or .NET. Like, there are so many programming languages. Um, and Python is one of them. Uh, there are a number of reasons why we chose Python for the introductory courses here on campus. Um, but it, it's going to be awesome, okay? Uh, here's a little bit about me. Uh, I am currently in Rigby Hall, room 338. I don't really get many people in here, especially because of COVID. Um, so, whoops. Um, so office hours are by appointment, okay? If you look in the syllabus, I'll cover this in a little bit, but there's a help document. And at the bottom of that is a link um, to set up appointments with me. And that'll just get thrown right onto my calendar and right on your calendars. Uh, there's my email, but uh, we're going to talk about why you shouldn't use that here in a little bit. I want you guys to use Slack instead. A lot of you guys have already joined our Slack workspace. Um, and then, yeah, okay. Uh, personal introduction. I guess I was just going to show you guys a quick picture here or a couple of pictures. Um, this is my wife, Sarah. We were married in the Spokane Temple almost seven years ago. We'll have our anniversary here in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then here are a couple of our kids. Okay, there's Clara, who's now two. And then Emily, who is four, and Hannah, who's six. Uh, these were up in the, this, this is String Lake, uh, out, out by the Tetons here near Rexburg. And there's William, our little guy. He just turned one back in September. So those are our four kids. Uh, they, they all grow really fast, and they also talk really fast. And sometimes it's exhausting, but I love hanging out with them. We, we like color every every morning at like 6 a.m. That's like the first thing we always do every morning is we just color and color and color. Um, but anyways, that's a little bit about me, a little bit about my family. Uh, so everything to do this lesson, okay? So there are two lessons this week. So this is, this is gonna be doubled, all right? Uh, but each week you'll have a checkpoint program. Uh, and that is basically something that you do after your reading to say, I did my reading and I know what's going on. 
Okay, if you can do your checkpoint, then you're good to proceed with your next assignments. That checkpoint is there for you more than anyone else. There is an icebreaker. Let me pull up Slack. Here's what Slack looks like. Uh, I would encourage you to download the Slack program on your computer or and mobile device. Okay, it's really nice. If you use it in the browser, you'll have to log in every time you wanna access it, which is a pain. Uh, but if you download it, you never have to log in again um, and you get notifications and it, it's, it's really nice. So I'd encourage you to download it. Uh, again, all of our communication will be here. If you wanna send me a message, just click on this plus by the direct messages. Uh, search for my name, Nathan or Brother Birch. I'll come up and you can, you can send me a message. I discourage you guys from messaging me in iLearn and Outlook for two reasons. One, I don't check them as much as Slack. And two, Slack has a very nice continuity to it that iLearn and Outlook do not support. If you guys send me an, uh, an email today, I will, I will respond to it and then either delete it, put it in some random folder that I'll never look at again or archive it, okay? Uh, in Slack, you send me a message right now asking about something and you send me a message in a couple of weeks, I'll be able to look at our history and see everything that we've talked about, which is really helpful for me because I have a terrible memory, okay? Uh, so please use Slack uh, any, anytime you want to message me. And then all of our um, group discussions and, and course discussions will be here as well. You'll notice there's also a help channel. Anytime you need help with code, post it here. All right. 95% of the time, if somebody asks me about code in a class, I will tell them to post on the help channel because I guarantee more than one person has that question. Okay. And so I will happily answer it there just so that more people can see it and we can all benefit from that. Uh, any any questions on Slack, you guys? Okay, sweet. I'm excited to use it. It's awesome. All right, icebreaker. You'll take a quiz in iLearn to report that you did it, and then you'll have a prove assignment. Uh, you'll submit the actual Python file in iLearn, uh, and then you'll have a self-reflection survey at the end of this week. Okay, other tasks to do in the next two days. Familiar yourself with, familiarize yourself with the syllabus. Download Slack and join Workspace and the preparation material, which includes downloading the software that we need for this class. All right, CSE 110, use programming building blocks, variables, conditionals, loops, lists to accomplish meaningful tasks in a variety of domains, develop confidence in learning new programming skills. Okay, these are good things to have if you're gonna go into programming. Everything will be done using Python. Uh, this video, we are not going to watch today, but let me show you guys something. So let me actually pull up our syllabus here. Here's our course. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a link to the syllabus. I will talk about this thing all the time because it is like the root of our course. If you have questions about how things are graded or if there's late work or where the video spreadsheet is or where to get help or when assignments are due or what each week looks like, all of that is here, okay? So in the syllabus, uh, there are a couple of things, okay? First thing right here is a link where to get help in this course. Then we have a Zoom class invitation. You guys made it, so it looks like you guys found this. Uh, and then a Slack invitation. All right, this will take you right over to Slack to, uh, to our workspace and you'll make an account within our workspace there. Uh, the where to get help in this course though, will take you to a Google Doc that has seven things, okay? Uh, and this is a document that you can go to anytime you need help. All right, if, you, if you're struggling with something and you're like, I'm stuck. Where do I go for help? Well, here's a nice numbered list for you. Okay, so I learn course content is your first line of defense. Okay, if there's an assignment that you have to do, chances are the topics that are required for the assignment were discussed in the readings in, in I learn. Uh, the next one is the video spreadsheet for the class. Let me just open this up. This I will add to every week for the rest of the semester. Okay, uh, the recording that is going on right now for this, for this meeting will be posted here under recorded lectures for lesson one and lesson two. Okay, so I guess half of these will be filled up. Filled up. Um, but then also for every one of your prove assignments, uh, you will have, uh, let me just hide those real quick. Um, I've made an introduction video for you. So if you're looking at a prove assignment and you don't know what to do, you can watch this video and I'll usually help to kind of get you started and point you in the right direction. And then after it's due, there's a walkthrough video. So if you weren't able to finish it on time, you can wake up at like 12.01 the next morning and watch my walkthrough video, could help with it and submit your assignment for, for a deducted point value, okay? Um, and also if you finish it well, but you just wanna see how someone else did it, the walkthrough videos will be here for you as well. 
Uh, these slides that I'm using will be available to you. So the video called Create by Dieter F. Uchtdorf, which is fantastic, and I would love to share with you guys, um, is in there. And I'd love for you guys to watch it. I just don't think we have time today. I'm trying to cover two weeks of material during this class. Okay. Uh, but this video spreadsheet will really be helpful for you guys. Um, and so that's in here as well. Uh, Google, here are some helpful tips on how to get answers from Google related, related to programming questions. All right. Uh, the help channel in Slack, this is huge because the TAs uh, and I monitor this, okay, and all of our students. So, you know, if Gavin has a question one, one week, Ian might be, be able to answer it, and then Connor might be, be able to answer a different one another time, but we'll all be able to help each other there. Uh, the tutoring center, this is a free resource to all students here at BYUI, okay? Uh, you can go to the tutoring center, pick whatever class you're in, find a tutor for that class and set up like recurring appointments with them for the entire semester. It's a really great way to get help. Um, and, and it's a really good way to just make sure that you have all your bases covered. Our class TAs, we have Felipe Fajeda. Uh, he is in here um, and he's fantastic. He's super smart. He's taken classes from me before. He's awesome. He's Brazilian. That's not the only reason why he's awesome, um, but he's great. And so I'm, I'm really grateful to have him. And then this link right here is to set up an appointment, with, an appointment with me. And like I said, once you go here, you pick a time slot and it'll get added directly to my calendar, okay? With the link and everything. So anytime you wanna talk, just go there, set up an appointment or just shoot me a message. I'm available frequently as well, but um, okay. Any questions about our help document for this class? Sweet, hopefully it's helpful. All right, uh, let's keep going. Okay. Technology is used in this course, Python 3. So this week we are going to try to rapidly install Python 3 on all of our computers. Okay, Gavin, you, you asked about Mac versus Windows. Uh, Mac, most, well, every Mac that I've ever seen has come pre-built with Python installed on it, which sounds really nice, but a lot of those are Python version two. We are using Python version three. So when you go to install Python 3, sometimes there's some issues and you have to jump through some hoops to make sure that your computer is running Python 3. Uh, so with that said, any issues that you guys have following the instructions in iLearn setting up Python on your computer, post on the help channel in Slack. Because again, you won't be the only one having that issue or with that question. Um, and everyone's, everyone's got to set up Python like today. Okay. So uh, we are using Python 3. VS Code. All right. This is what you will use to actually write code. All right. If I wanted to write a letter to someone and I was too lazy to pick up a pen, I would go to Microsoft Word or Google Docs. Once I print them up, the paper, you know, what's on the paper will look exactly the same. It doesn't matter what program I used. Uh, VS Code is very similar. There are many text editors, many ways and, and places in which you can write code. We're going to use Visual Studio Code. Okay. And then Slack, which we already talked about. You are expected to have a laptop or desktop that can run these applications. All right, course organization. We have seven weeks together. Um, and I'm assuming you guys took this on the block so that you can take CSE 111 on next block this semester, uh, in which case we might still be together in seven weeks, which would be awesome. Uh, but for this course, CSE 110, it will only last for seven weeks and we will have two lessons every week. Okay, each lesson will have a prepare, which will include links to readings and videos for you to watch. Um, if you haven't found a good video speed controller, uh, you might want to download one. Okay, I, I love watching YouTube videos just as much as the next guy, um, but sometimes I like to go a little faster. Um, and so I know Chrome has a good extension called uh, video speed controller that you can download and you can manipulate the speed. And so um, that might be helpful for you. Um, other people, they like to watch videos and program alongside them. Uh, and so whatever works for you. Like I said, there'll be a checkpoint at the end of each prepare just to help you see that you're ready to go on or help you see what you're lacking to make sure that you go back in the reading and check it out and, and get, what you, get what you need to. Uh, there will be a team activity. Next week, I will, well, hang on a sec. Nope, nope, I'll put you in a team today, okay? I will put you into teams today uh, because your first team activity you guys are going to do um, tomorrow, okay? We're not meeting as a class tomorrow. And then approve assignment every week, which is just an individual programming assignment. You can still ask questions on the help channel about these. Uh, obviously, you can't 
give peers all the answers or copy and paste your whole code to share. Uh, but we, I hope that we will all help each other in the help channel there. So in speaking about team activities, um, you will see this in the Zoom invite in the syllabus, but um, we are gonna be meeting on Monday and Wednesday every week. Um, and then Tuesdays and Thursdays of every week, you will meet with your team, okay? So we'll kind of do a recorded lecture like this on every Monday and Wednesday, and then we're not gonna meet together as a class on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, you'll also have a reflection at the end of every week, which is really simple. Um, and that is it. Any questions about what to expect? Sweet. All right, grading. Uh, here's the total grade breakdown for the class. This is in the syllabus, uh, but 15% of your total grade is going towards checkpoints, 20% towards team activities, 50 towards prove assignments, 10 towards check your understanding, and five towards reflections. 30, 50, okay. Um, so if you look at this, uh, a lot of this, you're, you're gonna get plenty of help on, okay? The reflections, the reflections, uh, should be really easy. That should be a, a 5% right there for your grade. Check your understanding, same thing. The checkpoints, uh, as long as you do the work, you'll get it, okay? Um, there is even uh, the code solution for every checkpoint in there. It just says to do the work first and then look at the solution after about an hour. Same thing with the team activities. You'll work with your team for an hour. If you finish it, great. If you don't finish it after an hour, you guys can look at the solution and get the help that you need. So that's 50% of your grade right there where the answers are pretty much given to you if you do the work and put forth the effort. Now that will take a lot of time. Uh, the university says that for every credit that you take, you should plan on three to four hours of time to spend on that credit. So this is essentially a four credit class that lasts for seven weeks. Um, so that's 12 to 16 hours every week that you should plan to dedicate to this class, okay? Uh, methodology, here's how we are going to grade your stuff. If you don't submit anything, you'll get a zero. Pretty straightforward. Uh, if, you, if you submit something, but it is severely lacking, then you'll get 50%. Uh, if you submit something and it's getting closer, we can see what you're trying to do, but there are a lot of errors still, then you'll get 75%. Uh, if it's really close, okay, we, we know exactly what you're trying to do. Most of the program works, but still not quite there yet, you'll get an 85 if it works and meets requirements, you'll get a 93. For you to get 100%, you have to go above and beyond. Uh, above and beyond. Most of the assignments have a stretch challenges portion to give you some ideas for how you can go above and beyond. And in addition to that, you can kind of, um, you know, anything that you can think of to make the program better, you can add to get that extra 7%. Letter grades will be awarded as follows. I feel like that's been the same our entire lives and it hasn't really changed much, so. That's just there for you, for you to see and, and know. All right, course communication, Slack. We already talked about this. Please don't email me or message me on iLearn. Uh, message me on Slack. Assignment help, use the help channel. And all of our discussions will be in Slack. None of them will be in iLearn. Late work policy. So I am explaining this to you because in the professional world, being punctual is a big deal, especially with software and programming. All right, for many reasons. Whether you're an independent consultant or a large firm, it's essential to deliver on client expectations. That includes fulfilling your contract within the established timeline. For the project, deadlines force you to think through the steps you need to achieve it. Each step will require a certain amount of time and that will better inform how long it will take you to finish the project. For you, when employees consistently meet deadlines, they're seen as reliable and responsible. These are marketable skills employees carry with them throughout their working lives. Okay, so, this is for all of us. This is for you, this is for me, this is for your futures, for your careers. Okay, for this reason, I do not accept late work policy or I do not accept late work at full credit, okay? I will deduct 10% per day that an assignment is late um, down to 50%, okay? So if you submit something in a couple of months, you can still get 50% for it, but that's the most that you can get for it. Uh, extenuating circumstances must be discussed with me prior to the due date, okay? I'm not out to get you guys. All right, if you tell me that you broke your leg and had to go to the emergency room, I'll be like, sweet, how much time do you need? Okay, <laughs> and I'll, I'll bump back whatever you need. If you tell me that you don't have internet, I'll be like, go get a Big Mac and sit at McDonald's and use their internet, okay? So I'm gonna be fair about this, all right? But um, there are extenuating circumstances. 
I understand that and I will be more than happy to accommodate. Just let me know before the due date. Okay. Um, and also with the accelerated course, I would highly discourage you um, for, from getting behind because it'll be nearly impossible to catch up if you get behind in this course. All right, how to be successful in the course. Work hard, schedule out the time needed for the class each week. All right, what I like to do anytime I'm putting together a schedule of classes um, is I add up how many hours that class is gonna take out of my time. If the university says 12 to 16 hours, I kind of know me, uh, I might assume that it'll take me nine to 12 or something. But maybe I block out 12 to 16 hours during the week in my schedule for this class. If I get extra time, great. I can go read a book, spend time somewhere else, find a date, do something else with my time. But if I plan out that time, then I will be successful, okay? Time is the biggest factor here. The resources to be successful, you are given in this class. And if you can just put forth the time, then you'll get it. Uh, use the resources provided, help document, pretty much it. The, the class is awesome. There's a lot of really helpful things in here. Uh, I feel like it ramps you up from no programming experience to the end of this class really well, all right? And so um, it'll just be fast on the block, but um, we're all in this together. Okay, and, and we'll be helping each other through this, the whole, the whole, the whole block. Uh, don't give up. Thomas Edison said, our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. My wife has wanted to take a programming class from me for years because she wants a good job that can pay her well working remotely from home while caring for children. Good ambitions, right? Um, but she hasn't wanted to do it for like a really long time. And I'm really proud of her this semester because she's finally taken one. She's not taking this one. She didn't want to do it on the block. Uh, she's taken um, CIT 160 from me, which is just, which is a JavaScript class. Um, but you guys, seriously, anyone can do this, okay? You can do this. Uh, if you just work hard, put forth the effort and don't give up, you can do this and you will learn this stuff. Uh, were, were there Was there a question? Did I see a hand? Okay, sweet. And rely on the Lord. President Nelson said he will enable you to accomplish the impossible. Not that this class is not that this class is impossible because it's not. Um, but if you rely on him, you guys, you will see miracles unfold in your life in every aspect of it, in CSE 110, and in much more important aspects of it. All right, hello world. Okay, so we're going to jump right into Python. Any questions about the structure of the class? Late work, how to meet with me. Um, I yeah, have a question yeah. about Tuesday and Thursday. I don't, we don't meet with you. Well, so we were just meeting in teams. So do we um, assess through the same link that we do for us? Yeah, so you can decide with your team what medium to use. If you wanna use Skype, yeah. Facebook Messenger, Google Hangouts, Google Meet, Zoom, um, you guys can choose. I would recommend meeting during our class time just to keep things simple. But if all of you happen to be on the East Coast and want to meet a couple hours earlier, that's whatever works for you guys. Um, but if you guys can't agree on a time, then you'll meet at our regular class time and you'll just pick a Zoom link to use. Uh, there is, where'd this go? Um, in here, if I go to modules, into module one, It was in module two. It might be for the, the lesson two team activity. Right here, it is recommended that you, that you Zoom for the virtual meeting. Uh, view this link on how to create a Zoom meeting. You guys all have Zoom accounts with the university. Um, and if you don't know how to find like your Zoom link, uh, you can go here and, and figure that out. Okay, that's a great question. Thank you, Esther. Uh, and we will be assigned a team I mean, the group by the end of this class. Uh, by the end of today. By oh, okay, end. okay. Yeah. Good, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Okay. Okay. Um, generally, I like to I like to set up teams like in week two of a course, just because sometimes people add and drop in the first week. Uh, but you guys have a team activity that's due this week, and so um, you guys are going to be doing that tomorrow, and so I'll give you guys teams today, and you will see yourself added to a channel in Slack. Uh, let me just show you that. So here are all of my channels for this class, and I will just add a few private channels, and I will add three to four students to each one. Okay, so you'll just see yourself added to a channel in Slack, and that'll be your team. All right. 
Okay, great questions. Any more questions about the course? I know we went kind of fast. It's pretty intense. Okay, well, I'm not going anywhere. If you guys have questions, just post them on Slack. Okay, uh, jumping into Python. So um, there are a few things. I would go through Python installation, but we all have different computers and various operating systems, and it will be different for each. So as you go through the readings, there are really good instructions. I've read them all. They're super good instructions on how to download and install Python. All right. It is likely that you will come across an issue. If you do, don't panic. Just post on Slack and then start searching Google. Okay. Um, there are issues every time somebody tries to install Python, whether it's in CSE 110, 210, or 310. There are always issues and it's okay. Okay. I'll be here to help you and, um, and we'll all be here to help each other. Uh, after that, let's talk a little bit about Python itself. So variables are a way that we can store data in a program. So let's think about why we might want to do that. Okay. Um, let's say I hopped onto Google and I start typing something into Google and all of a sudden this, this little box opens up underneath the search bar with like all these suggested searches. Sometimes they're really helpful. Sometimes they're not, but sometimes they're really helpful. Okay. Now, if I'm thinking from a programming perspective, every single one of those suggestions is stored in a variable in data in the program. Okay. My programs, they can't really do anything without variables. All right. If I ask, if I have a program that, you know, asks you for a number and I will show you that number cubed, or something, I have to be able to like store your number to do something with that. Okay, otherwise I won't be able to, I, I won't be able to show you your number cubed. So pretty much anywhere you are on a website or in any pieces of any piece of software, there are variables in play. Many, 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 many variables because they're needed for pretty much everything. So variables do several things. They allocate memory. There's runtime allocation and dynamic allocation. All right, what this means is if I have a program that makes a variable as soon as like just written in the code, then as soon as I run the program, it will create that variable and allocate that space in memory. Where in memory, it'll start using up my computer's RAM. Okay, so the bigger program you have, the more variables, the more space in RAM it'll use up. Now, variables are really small generally, and that's why I can have like Outlook and several things of Google Chrome open and a bunch of Chrome extensions and Zoom and Teams and Slack, and you're never gonna like crash your computer with a Python program unless it's like a virus, which is possible, but you're probably not gonna write one in this class, okay? Um, but they allocate memory. Dynamic allocation is an example like what I just said, when you ask a user for a number and they give it to you and then you assign it to a variable, okay? That's not a runtime. That's not when you like hit the start button on your program to run. That'll happen while your program is running. It will dynamically allocate memory, space and memory for that variable. Uh, store data. Data storage is organized and everything is referenced by variable name. Okay. Um, I could store about a billion things in a program and it doesn't matter if there's no way to access those pieces of data. So every time I store something in, in memory, every time I, I have a variable, that variable will have a name so that whatever piece of data I have, I can go and reference it. So let's say um, you guys are writing a program about this class and there's a variable called professor name. The, con the, the data in that variable will probably be Nathan Birch, right? But to access that variable, you will use the variable name, professor name. Then if next semester you wanted to rewrite that program or change the professor name, you wouldn't have to change the variable name. You would just change its value to another name, another, another professor's name, okay? But all of our data, all of our variables are going to have names and that's how we reference them. And that is how we are able to retrieve data. Uh, to use throughout programs, variables can be used as many times as needed. How to be smart with variables. In almost all programs, many variables will be used simultaneously to perform a task. In order for these variables to be manageable, it's important to choose good names for them. So consider the following variable names. Okay, here are a few variable names. We, we can call variables pretty much anything we want. In any programming language, there are a few reserved keywords, which you can't use for anything, including variables, na variable names. Um, but outside of those, the rest of 
the language and other languages and made up languages are at your disposal for variable names. You can seriously call them anything you want. Um, but these variables all have something in common. Uh, they're really vague. Uh, they could be anything and they're terrible. They're terrible because they're vague and they could be anything and that's not helpful. If I'm looking at a program and it's a couple hundred lines of code long and it's full of variable names like this, I would be so frustrated. I'd be like, oh, what is X? What's num and variable? Like we need, we need pr productive names. So consider these variable names. We have person age, raccoon height, favorite color, first name, random number. Okay, all of these are specific. Um, it is clear what they represent and the program will, the programmer will know what they mean in several years. And I say in several years because I look back at some of my programs that I wrote when I was in school and I have no idea what they're doing. I'm like, it would take me a long time to figure out what is going on here. Okay. And so if you write your code with good variable names, that is the first step to actually understanding your code. And some of us like me with shorter memory, um, I'll, I'll look at a program that I wrote like a couple weeks down the road and I'm like, what is going on here? Okay. And so it's important to use good variable names. They should be specific, meaningful, not be too short. Okay. There, there are some exceptions to that, which we'll talk about later in the semester. Shouldn't be too long. We don't want like full sentences for our variable names. Um, not that there's like a technical issue with that. They're just hard to read. You know, it would take up a lot of space in your text editor. Uh, obeying Python standards, lowercase and underscores to separate words. If you look at these five variables right here, they're all lowercase and they all have underscores to separate their words. Now, other programming languages have different standards. You know, um, some of them, a lot of them don't use underscores, uh, but in Python, they'll, they're lowercase with underscores. Uh, and they should help you and any other programmer when working with your program. All right, so let's say I want to store my name in a variable. All right, I want my computer to be able to save my name, okay? The way I do that in Python is with our equal sign. We've all seen equal signs for many years, okay? But if I want to assign a piece of data to a variable, I use our equal sign, okay? The variable name, in this case, is just name. And I'm, I'm giving the piece of data, Nathan, to the variable name, okay? Uh, then, okay, name is the variable name. Nathan is the data that's saved in memory. We access this data by using the variable name, the actual name of the variable. So if I wanted to use that variable, uh, I would just use the variable name. So this function on line six, the print function, will basically just display my name to the console. Okay, so uh, let me close out of this just for a sec and let me show you guys VS Code. Here's what it looks like. If you've already downloaded it, it might look a little different. There are a couple of things that I have done uh, with VS Code um, to make it more user-friendly. So I'm gonna open up a new window here. Uh, here's what it looks like. Now, what I would recommend that you do is on your computer, go ahead and make a folder for this class, for all of the programs that you're gonna write. Okay, so what this might look like, at least on a Windows computer, uh, maybe I go to my documents and let's see, I don't have a folder called school. I might wanna make a folder called school. And then inside of school, I'll make another folder called CSE 110, okay? Now that I have this, there are two ways that I can do this. Basically, I wanna open up this folder in VS Code. It'll really help me the entire semester, okay? I can just drag it over and I hope this works. Okay, good, it looks like it's gonna work. Uh, now I see CSE 110s right here. Basically, I just open this folder right here. And so anytime I have files, they'll show up right here and I can navigate easily. So if I did something in a checkpoint that's gonna help me in my team activity, I can just, I could even have both of them open at the same time if I wanted to, it's great. Uh, the other way to do it is just hit file and open folder. And that'll open up your little file explorer and you could click on it and say select folder. Okay, once I'm in here, I can click on new file and I'll just say lesson one practice dot pi. Okay, uh, when you work with like a doc file or, or you're like writing a paper for an English class, you're gonna have doc files or docx files. Sometimes you'll have a PDF. We have PNGs and JPEGs and those are some really common file types that we're all familiar with. Uh, Python might be a new one for some of you, probably most of you, uh, but the file extension for that is just py. Okay, so anytime I wanna write code in Python, I'll make a new file called some name dot py, all right? 
So now that I have it, uh, I can say name equals, uh, let's do Johnny, okay? So now when this code runs, that data, Johnny, is going to be stored in memory and I can access it by using the variable called name, okay? So in my program, if I wanna use it, I can say print name. All right, so I'm gonna hit save. Uh, the hotkey to do that was just control S, just like in Microsoft Word. Um, and then I can actually come over here. Well, I'm not gonna actually do that. That's not always reliable. So I'm gonna click on terminal right here. And you can see documents, school, CSE 110. This is the folder that I'm in. All right. I know this black box might be intimidating to some of you. We've seen it in like hacking movies, um, but it's okay. All we're going to do with it is just say pi and then the name of a file, practice.py. And that's it. Okay. This will run my program. All right. As long as Python is installed correctly on my computer, this will run it. I just hit enter. And look at that, Johnny popped up in my terminal. That's fantastic. Okay, that's my first program, okay? So I wrote the name Johnny, assigned it to a variable named name, and then I went and said print name. Well, I, I could do all sorts of this stuff, all right? I could say print, and I if I didn't wanna use a variable, I could just start writing in here and say, this is awesome, I love Python. Okay, I hit save, and I come back over here. And here's a quick, uh, a quick a little hotkey for you guys. In my terminal, if I hit my up arrow, it'll show me the last command that I executed. That, that saves me lots of time. And it'll save you lots of time, to, a, lot, a lot of time too. I'll hit enter and look at that. It printed both of them up for me. Okay, so there's my first Python program in the works. Now, a couple of things about running Python on your computer, okay? Uh, Windows users, this will be in the instructions but you will have to include it in your path variable. The easiest way to get there is to right click on this PC and click on properties. Just by a show of hands, how many of you guys have a Windows computer? Okay, so majority, okay. Um, anyone else, it looks like Elijah and Esther might not have Windows computers. Um, I might still be able to help you. Um, but it might just take me longer, okay? Would uh, it be better to run in Windows? I have boot camp set up so I could. Uh, whatever you want. Uh, I have Windows, and so it'd be easier for me to help you if you had Windows, uh, but only if it's easy for you to do in Windows. You know, if you have a Mac, it'll work. As, as soon as you get Python installed, Python itself is not different in different operating systems. Just the way that it is installed on an operating system is a little bit different, okay? so. Hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll all have it installed um, and then it really won't matter for the rest of your life, which, which one you use, so. Um, but Windows users, advanced system settings, and then environment variables, okay? Now, the reason why we have to go here is because Python is installed on my computer inside of app data, local programs, Python, Python 3832, that's where it is. Now, for me to run Python, I have to be in that folder to run it because that's where all the Python files are, okay? Um, but I don't wanna be in that folder to run it. I want to be able to make a CSE 110 folder on my computer and have that be with the rest of my school stuff. So for this to be accessible everywhere on your computer, you put it in your environment variable and then it doesn't matter where I am in here, I can run Python code, okay? That's why you have to do that. All right. Any questions about this? Okay, you will also get more help, especially as you do the reading, um, but also in our video spreadsheet. Uh, I've, I've already started making videos for you guys um, that, that will hopefully be helpful as well. All right, let's look at our next one. Uh, different data types. Okay, this is really important. Something that we haven't really thought about much before haven't really had much purpose to, um, but when I have a number, it's just a number, okay? There are generally two types of numbers. There's an integer, which is a whole number, no decimal point. And then there's what we call a float, a floating point number, uh, which just, it just means that it can have a decimal, okay? So we have int and float, whole numbers, decimal numbers. Um, and then Nathan right here is what we call a string, 
Anytime we just have text inside of quotation marks, that's what we call a string. Uh, and then here's an example of float. Uh, I did the, the conversion from inches to feet the other day, and I am 5.875 feet tall. Okay. Um, but that, that's what a float looks like. And you notice lines 1, 10, and 11 are all doing something very similar. I'm taking a piece of data and I'm storing it inside of a variable that I can then reference later. If I wanted to print up age, I could. If I wanted to print height and feet, I could. Okay. Once these are, once these are saved in variables, I can use these variables as many times as I want. Okay. Questions about this? Okay. Anytime there aren't any questions, I, I always hope that there aren't any questions. Sometimes I, I fear that people are like, I'm, I, there are so many questions, I don't even know what to ask. Um, but hopefully, hopefully you guys are doing okay. All right, print and input functions. So we already looked at print. All right, we just printed up a name. Um, and all that does is just show something on the console. That's it. It just writes it to the console or prints it or displays it, however you want to think of it. Now, in memory, I'm not going to go too much into this, but um, these letters are all stored in their own like little slot in memory, but all together. And that's how my, my program can know um, everything that's inside of name. Um, I can also print what's called a literal string. Okay, this isn't a variable because it's in quotation marks. It'll just print whatever is in between the quotation marks. Right here, uh, when I said print name, it didn't print the word N-A-M-E to the console, it printed the value of the variable name, which is in this case, Nathan. But right here, because I have quotation marks, this will actually print the string literal, which is everything in between the quotation marks. Uh, I can also print a number if I wanted to. Uh, is this number a float or an int? Int. Close, it is actually a float. Okay, floats are the ones with a decimal point. Okay, integers are always going to be whole numbers. Okay, what's number five or what's age? Is that a float or an int? Int. That one's an int. Yeah, great. Okay, um, integer saved in memory. When, it, when a number is saved in memory, that whole number goes into one slot, no matter how many digits there are. Uh, Larissa, you have a question? Yes. Can I, could I not name though a variable? a number and then in that case wouldn't it be confusing yeah that's a great question so variable names cannot be a number okay so and, and what i mean by that is um if i wanted to call a variable like five equals five okay i could do that that works because this is actually not a number this is four letters that spell out a number but if i try to do like this that doesn't work Okay, um, I cannot name a variable an actual number. Got it. Thank you. Great question. Thank you for bringing that up. All right. Um, now let's look at input. Okay, so we looked at the function called print. All right, and what does print do? It displays the variable or data said the parameters perfect yeah so whatever's in those parentheses it'll just display it in, in the console where you're running your program now input is pretty cool because it does what print does all right it'll display something on the, on the screen but then it also lets you type something which is pretty cool so let's try this i'm going to come back over here and i'm gonna you know what? i'll leave this because i this is awesome and i do love python but i'm going to say input uh, real quick, notice, let me uh, zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see. In VS Code, I'm going to type in I, and look at this little box that popped up. I'm just going through here with my arrow. Uh, here's a bunch of stuff um, that is in Python, because this is a Py file, that I can use. And look, input is right here, and all I have to do is just hit tab or enter, and there's my input. Okay, it's pretty awesome. And then I open up my parentheses and then I type something. I say, please enter an age. Oops. Okay. Now, watch what happens when I run this. Up arrow, hit enter. It says, Johnny, this is awesome. So we had this print and this print. 
And then we have this input, which look what it did. It printed, please enter an age onto here. But there's also a cursor. Okay, so I could type in like 54 and hit enter and now my program's done. Okay, so the input does exactly what print does, except it allows the user to type in something, which is sweet, okay? Now, if I wanted to use that 54, notice the program just ended. If I wanted to use that 54, I would do pretty much the exact same thing as I did in line one, okay? So I'm gonna say uh, user age equals, oops, equals, and then whatever number they type in, we'll get assigned to this variable. All right, let's test this. I'm gonna come down here and I'll say print user age. All right, okay, I'm gonna run this one more time. Clicking down here, up arrow, I'll hit enter. Johnny, this is awesome, I love Python. Please enter age, uh, 21, and look at that. Before I ended this time, it printed 21, okay? So it's definitely different. It's a different way of thinking, all right? But at the same time, it's pretty simple. You know, if I want to print something, I put it into the print. Uh, if I want data from the user, I have to use input. If I want to use that data, I have to put that data somewhere. In this case, I just say user age equals. Okay. Um, okay. Any questions on this? Yeah, go ahead, Tyler. Um, so looks like, so I know C++ a little bit. Okay. And you, do you not have to declare like when C++ you write int, then you write what you want to name that int. Yeah, so, so C++ is an example of a typed language. It is a language of types, uh, meaning that every single variable that you ever declare, you have to say what data type it is. And so in C++, if I had a name that was John, I would have to say string name equals John semicolon. Right. Um, Python is a language that while types do exist and it recognizes uh, that this is a string, I do not have to explicitly state string when I when I declare this 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 variable. Does that help? Yeah, just it's all kind of weird and confusing. Come uh, so you see plus plus. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. You're like, wait, there's something missing here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Some people like the chains, and some people are like, dude, I can't. I mean, this, is, this is awful. So hopefully, hopefully you like it. But, okay. Other questions about this? Okay. Well, let's keep going. All right. Okay. Check this out. Input. Please enter your age. The user typed in twenty. And right now the two and zero are actually stored in different slots in memory. That is because input, no matter what you type in, even if you type in 20, will always return a string, okay? So uh, today and tomorrow, this isn't really that big of a deal, but next week you're gonna be doing arithmetic. You'll be doing math. You'll be, you'll be saying, uh, please enter the age of everyone in the class and let's find out our total age and average it or something, you know? But you'll have to do math. You'll have to do addition, subtraction, multiplication. And you cannot do that with a string. You just can't. You can't multiply words together. It, it won't know what to do. It'll throw an error and your program will break. Well, anytime you use the, the, the function input, no matter what the user types, it will always return a string. Python is not that smart, okay? So um, instead, what we're gonna have to do after we get data from the user is we use a function called int. Now, yes, int is a data type, but there's also a function that will allow you to turn anything into an int. To an extent, if I have an actual word like Nathan and try to turn it into an int, my program will break. Okay, uh, but if I have a number like two zero, um, that's actually a string. I can just say, okay, int. Let's put the user age in there, and it will return an integer. Okay, and then I could do I could do math with that, or I could do comparisons. Or I could say, hey, if their age is less than than twenty, then something. Okay. Um, there's a lot, there's lots of different types of things that we can do in programming with number data types that we cannot do with strings and vice versa. Okay. Uh, but be aware that input always returns a string. All right. Let's see here. We have four minutes. Let's go ahead and do this. We might not be able to finish this, you guys. Okay. But, but we're going to do a Kahoot real quick. I can log in. 
Have any of you done cahoots before? I couldn't see. Did anyone say yes? Oh, sweet. Very cool. All right. Well, that didn't work. Uh, let me try one more thing. Sweet. All right. Let's go ahead and play this. Okay, so go to www.kahoot.it and then you'll punch in this pin. All right, looks like we've got just about everyone here. Okay, let's go ahead and start. Felipe, you can join if you want to. Okay. When you want to write a program, what application should you open? Nice. All right. So VS Code is exactly what I told you. And the two people that picked the green one, yes, any text editor can work. Uh, the three people that chose Python 3, Python 3, let's say I'm going to write an English paper. Um, yes, I'm going to use English to write it, but the software that I need to use to write it is Microsoft Word or Google Docs. Okay. And so remember, Python 3 is the language that we're going to write in, but the software to use, the program or the application open. We're going to use VS Code. All right. Elijah, nice work. By the way, if anyone hasn't played this, if you answer faster, you get more points. True or false? Programs written in Python 3 can be run in Python 2, but will run a little slower. OK. Nice job to the 90 that chose false. The reason why it's an issue when Macs come pre-built with Python 2 and we have to change it to Python 3, I wouldn't really care that much if it was just a speed issue, but it's not. Python 3 cannot be run uh, by Python 2. Okay, next up. Which of the following prints the word Brigham on the screen? Okay, nice job, you guys. Uh, the red one, if we had a variable named Brigham, then yes, that would do it. Uh, and the yellow one, anyone know why that one doesn't work? It's capitalized. It's a capital P. Yeah, programming languages are pretty sensitive. Um, and so Python is a, is a case sensitive language and print doesn't exist unless you made it like that. So, okay, well, you guys, that is the end of our class today. Um, hopefully next week we'll have more time. I, I do have more cahoots planned for you guys. Um, but this class will be recorded. I'll post the recording later on today, hopefully. I'll get you into your teams later on today. And if you have any questions at all, don't don't hesitate to post on Slack or send me or, or Felipe a message, okay? Okay, good luck. Keep an eye on the course. You, you guys are doing lesson one and lesson two by the end of Saturday this week, okay? I will see you all on Monday. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Hey, thank you guys. See you later. See ya.